Hello, hello, hello. How's everybody doing? See, we got a couple of people in here. We got uh, Just My Fish. Hello, welcome. And we got Sandy. Hello, Sandy. Welcome to the stream. I, uh, <clears throat> yeah, so what I want to do with this stream is uh, I want to talk about fish breeding, not just fish keeping or, or, yeah, not just fish keeping. I want to focus on fish breeding for the fish breeders out there, aquarium fish breeding. So reason for this is that this is what I do. This is what I do. I do keep aquariums just for the sake of keeping them, but I also breed fish for the sake of breeding them and uh, to try and market them and uh, make a profit off of it. Um, so I guess the reason I want to do a, maybe even a series of streams on this is A, I found a lot of my content is getting stale to me. I'm talking about the same things over and over. I'm not really indulging in any uh, depth, um, so to speak. And uh, I'd like to indulge in a little more depth of some topics. And uh, the topic that interests me most, and this is my stream, so that's what we're going to do, is fish breeding. Um, and the reason is, is that there's a big, big, big difference between fish breeding and fish keeping. Fish keeping, the rules are different. Let's face it, the rules are different. Hey, Rico Stan, welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, the rules are different. And some of you might ask, what, what do you mean? Why are the rules different? I'll tell you why the rules are different. So when we tell a beginner aquarist, some uh, information, some education, when we offer it, whether they want it or not. Um, we're offering them education on how to keep a personal aquarium balanced. And most people who want to keep fish don't want to keep just one type of fish. They want to keep a couple of different kinds of fish. Um, they don't want to do an over amount of water changes and, uh, and really no work with water chemistry. Um, so we we have different rules for beginner aquarists as we generally give advice on it. Y'all are guilty of it. I am too. Giving different advice for beginning aquarists compared to if we're breeding fish. So we want the beginner aquarist to be able to keep an aquarium keep it balanced with minimal effort, with minimal effort, with minimal um, eye for detail, eye for detail, eye for if your fish are acting particular, uh, kind of in a weird way, um, whatever, more looking at that than looking at water chemistry, uh, the amount we're feeding, all this other stuff, the amount of fish we're putting in a, a, a broad stock tank, a tank we're using just to just to raise out baby fish, uh, we may be using uh, way more filters. We may be using way more volume of water. We may be doing way more water changes, and we may be adding way, way more food. Uh, and if you don't do all those things together, then we have a problem. So if you're, if we're giving advice to the beginner, of course, say just add a little bit of food. They just need a little bit of food, and it's true. The fish do just need a little bit of food, but they also just need a little bit of a water change too when they have just a little bit of food because they give off just a little bit of waste. So that's where differences happen, right? The inch per gallon rule. I personally have never follow it. Actually, some of my tanks are way below the inch per gallon rule, and some of my tanks are have blown that out of the water. But I've also blown the filtration per gallon rule out of the water, and the water changes per gallon out of the water as well. So I'm rambling a little bit, but I'm trying to get a point across that we could talk all day about keeping fish, uh, snails, shrimp, everything else but it does not pertain to breeding fish. There is a different set of rules. And so we're gonna go over my set of rules. 
Um, the reason I say my set of rules is because everybody's rules are different and there's no right way and there's no wrong way to breed fish. There's my way and there's your way and there's their way and their way. There's everybody's way and everybody uses what works for them. Um, and I guess if I'm going to add just a, a tidbit, a tidbit of advice is try to take a little bit of everybody's way. I like to listen to a lot of different people read. I read a lot. Uh, I'm actually guilty that I actually don't watch a lot of YouTube videos. I'm on YouTube. I do the YouTube thing. But unfortunately, I'm busy breeding fish and usually reading on how to breed fish in my spare time um, when I'm coming up to new challenges. So I actually don't have a lot of time to watch YouTube. But uh, we got to, yeah, read. I do a lot of reading on uh, on what I'm doing. Sorry, I'm just gonna have a quick check here, see if there's any uh, any questions. Uh, a couple comments, and uh, just my fish says a cold water change is using a shower head. I always seem to get my African cichlids to breed, and uh, yep, that. That does help sometimes, most definitely helps sometimes. And uh, I actually, believe it or not, guys, I even wrote an itinerary for today. I wrote an itinerary on stuff I want to go over. And I'm going to touch on African cichlids. I'm, I'm not sure if everybody could see it or not. At the start of the stream, uh, I posted a picture from 2010, and that was one of my female breeders, Mipibwe Frontosa's uh, F1s. Um, I had a, a huge, I had a colony of like 12 of them. Um, and that was one of my, my African breeding, uh, African cichlid breeding adventures, uh, 11 years ago. Um, I bred most, no, I shouldn't say most, there's a gazillion species of African cichlids. I've bred over a hundred species of African cichlids successfully. Um, in the past I've been, uh, I've owned African cichlids, uh, since I was 12 years old. So I'm getting pretty old now. That's almost 30 years. So I've uh, bred quite a few over the years, and uh, we'll talk about breeding them a bit. I'll touch on it today, and then maybe in the future we'll start just doing this uh, on species uh, specific. And then if you're interested in that species, you can tune in. If you're not, don't bother. <laughs> but uh, today I'm going to just touch a little bit on everything, just get everybody revved up and, and kind of into uh, what what things work for breeding uh, fish in different styles of fish breeding operations. Uh, so yeah. So first off, I kind of want to talk about uh, one sec. Yes, Terry, and welcome to the stream, Terry. Yes, printed material. I, I love it. I love all the old magazines, uh, aquarium magazines, and whatnot. Um, kind of, kind of not. Kind of, kind of not. There's, uh, yeah, there is obviously some very huge differences. Uh, breeding frontosis clearly isn't the same as uh, breeding brevis or, or multifasciatus. Um, uh, yeah, there's some differences, but uh, yeah, if uh, you do a lot of the things right, you'll you'll get what you're looking after. Yeah, I, I bet I bet you are. Um, they are a, a fickle, a fickle front to try and get them to uh, breed. I have had success with them in the past, and uh, in a little bit when I get to African cichlids, we'll go over that. Um, some things that might help. Um, so first off, there's obviously different types of breeding setups. So uh, the big thing that's been that was huge for the longest time. Everything you've seen on YouTube, almost everybody did one, was a video on fish tank for profit. And it usually involved a 35 to 55 gallon fish tank. And it involved uh, some incestuous, bristle nose plecos, uh, guppies, and usually cherry shrimp and plants, live plants. And it's a fantastic concept. And if that's what you want to do, 
it's a great way to generate a little bit of income from your fish room. Uh, if you uh, breed and raise out Ancestress right in that tank, almost every pet shop will take them off your hands. If you uh, breed uh, guppies in that tank, you will end up with run-of-the-mill guppies. Uh, they'll be like dollar guppies eventually. You might have beautiful ones come out. Many beautiful, but you'll have many, many calls. You'll have many, many that should, should never even be sold, probably. Uh, due to the fact that it, it, it won't be, it's just generalized harem breeding. Uh, you're not looking for s uh, specific traits to uh, uh, come out of them. You, you're just letting them do their thing. Everybody's breeding with everybody, and uh, what you get is what you get. Uh, so, but they still have they still have a monetary value. You're still going to get a buck or two a piece for them. And uh, so if you add that with the buck or two a piece you get for the bristle nose, if you can take a couple hundred in at a time, a hundred bristle nose and a hundred uh, guppies, there's some money at your local uh, fish store. Or if you want Aquarius to come to your house and purchase them, it's a much more difficult thing to do. Um, they'll come and purchase them and you'll get a, a little bit uh, – You'll get a little bit more money for them, but a, a lot more hassle um, with uh, just a bunch of strangers coming to your house. Um, yeah, do you want to introduce all these people to your family? You don't know them all. Most Aquarists I've met are great people, but let's face it, there's shady people in, in, in every walk of life. And uh, that's one thing to consider is do you want all these people coming to your home? Whether you're a single person or you have a family, um, you have to make that dis decision and, and maybe uh, do – this will be this was actually supposed to be later in the stream, but it's an important part of selling. Uh, quite often, I, I do a little creeping on people before uh, I say yay or nay. They can come to my house if I have their full name. I will uh, I'll creep them on Facebook. I'll uh, I'll have a look to see if they're see if they're on the up and up or see if maybe I don't want those people in my house. And as a seller, you have that choice. Bottom line, so exercise that choice and write and uh, keep your family safe if you're going to allow strangers to come to your house to buy fish. On the flip side of that, if you are going to sell wholesale uh, to local fish stores, something needs to happen before that happens and that's establishing a relationship. And I know that's I've watched YouTube videos that and this is what people say, but guess what is true. So you're only ever going to get store credit for the most part, if you don't have an established relationship with uh, your local fish store. So what I have always done is establish those relationships. And I have many, many uh, local fish stores that I can sell wholesale to. They trust my quality. They trust my size. Uh, I don't short them on size and I don't short them on quality. I make sure they get the quality of fish that I say those fish are. And um, we have no problems. We exchange fish, I get money, and uh, we go on with our day and everybody's happy. But that didn't just instantly happen. I worked myself up to that. I proved myself as a fish breeder. And uh, that eventually happens when you do that for, for long enough. It's like anything else. If you're trying to do a, a raising fish for profit fish tank, you're essentially trying to start a business. Uh, that's what you're doing. You're doing a business venture. You're investing money into it. You're investing your time into it. Um, and you're investing your reputation into it. Uh, so, yeah, you're, 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 you're going on a business venture. And every business needs to establish a relationship and a reputation. And uh, until you do that, it'll be a bit of a struggle maybe to get rid of some of your fish. But uh, if you're breeding fish that there is a demand for, and uh, you keep a good reputation of selling quality fish, um, good things will will happen. And I see, uh, I see uh, Terry has uh, put uh, best way to sell fry in my humble opinion is club auctions and swaps. That is very true, Terry. And uh, that's I've purchased and sold many many fish at at club auctions and swaps. And what that does essentially is it does support the club that is hosting the auction as they get uh, a portion of, of the proceeds. 
And also, it helps you meet other aquarists if you just want to swap amongst yourselves, whatnot. Uh, problem is, we haven't had those in over a year now uh, because of uh, this COVID stuff. So that's been out the door uh, for over a year. And, and I'm assuming if that is what a lot of people solely relied on as a means to sell their fish, uh, they must have an awful backlog of uh of fish in their fish rooms okay so there's the the aquarium for profit the aquarium for profit tank that has a mix of a different couple types of fish and live plants if you're doing that as well so the live plant propagation end of it is actually quite lucrative if you think about it you don't other than fertilizer you don't really have to feed plants. If you have a green thumb, plants are a meal ticket. They go for very good money, and they don't take a lot of space. Um, I actually know a lot of people that actually just, that's all they do in some tanks is plants. There's not even fish in their plants. They keep them snail free, fish free, everything free, and uh, they just do plants. I have another friend in, uh, in Washington in the States. Uh, Jason from Redfish Bluefish, he does uh, micro stem plant propagation where he, he basically makes like a hundred plants out of one little piece of plant. Uh, and, and, and that's and that's a big part of his business is, is selling plants. So don't forget about plants on that. And that takes care of that too, but it, it, it doesn't make you any money if you're in it for profit, Terry. Um, I guess it's free food, and, and I'm not against that. And on that topic, I'll get to another part. If you want to be a fish breeder, if you want to be a fish breeder, you have to be able to be ready for some hard, uh, some hard truths and some things that you may have to do in order to maintain a good reputation uh, and or quality of fish and that is calling and this is where that would come into handy if you did have some bigger predator fish uh, that you wanted the natural chain of natural food events to happen um, that's an avenue for your fish that are not up to snuff not all fish are born uh, perfect not all fish are born as nice as their parents were uh, some fish are born nicer than their parents were. Some fish are born much, much less nice than their parents were. So if you're trying to maintain a quality of fish, a, a quality of color, a, a standard, and which you should be if you are going to be a serious fish breeder, then those fish, in my humble opinion, should not leave your fish room. Um, that's my opinion. I have in the past, as I may be getting called a hypocrite right now, uh, gave away some clownfish babies. I, I bred a batch of clownfish that were not all perfect. They, some of them had some gill issues. Now, that being said, I didn't recognize this issue because I was very new to clownfish breeding, as I still am. And I let them get big enough, and my they, they did, these guys pulled at my heartstrings, and I could not call them. I just couldn't do it. So I gave them away. And the reason I gave them away is because they're still going to live a long, long life. I gave them away telling the people that I gave them to that they're really not meant to be bred. I'm giving them to you as a pet and hope that you keep them for the life of them as a pet. But that's not the norm. Normally, if I see deformities or issues, I take care of it when they're still very, very young. And uh, I take care of it in this exact manner. But you have to be ready to do that. If you don't, um, there will be an awful flood of... Uh, low quality fish getting out and uh, and yeah it kind of in my opinion um, if large numbers of low quality fish are getting out uh, we could be doing a detriment to the hobby wet my whistle for a sec so I hope I'm not losing anybody some of this is boring but some of it's very 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 important um, some of these things about selling fish and whatnot, it seems like boring, blah, blah, blah. But if you don't have that, then what are you going to do with your fish after you've bred them all? The other thing that brings me to is um, your time requirements. Um, 
what I try to do, and I try to keep it very real, that I have a family, I have a large family, I have a large house to take care of, and I am self-employed um, with my own business, my own contracting business. So a lot of the times, a uh, time is not on my side. So I am very, I'm very cognizant of the available time I have, and that's why I made mention earlier that I don't watch a lot of YouTube videos, and I'm sorry if I miss some of your guys' YouTube videos. I just don't have time to watch them all in between running my own business, looking after my family, household, um, and all these tanks. And not necessarily just all these tanks, all these breeding projects I have going on. Some of them are very, very, very labor intensive and uh, demand a lot of my time. A lot of my time. So that is something, please, if you're going to breed fish, please make sure you have the time. Make sure you have the absolute time to take care of what you are taking on. Uh, you will get better at it. You will get better at it. If you find that you're, you know, it's taking you hours to do water changes on a, on a few tanks. Okay, I can do water change on my tanks that don't require RO water. On my just straight up tap water tanks, I can do 10 tanks in an hour. 10 tanks in an hour. That's including a 180 gallon tank. That's because I've devised some ways to be efficient. And uh, these live streams are going to go over some of that as well. Efficiency. If you're going to do it, I value my time. I know what I make at my regular self-employed job. And uh, I know what my time's worth. So I, this is a hobby to me, and I, and I really, really enjoy it. So I'm not like a stickler. I need to make this much an hour in my fish room. I, I try not to even look at that because it's pathetic, to be honest with you. Um, but... My time is worth something. So if I am doing it solely for profit, then my my time has to be allowed in there. Um, make sure you enjoy it. Make sure you enjoy it. If you don't enjoy it, if you don't have, I guess for me, if I was going to be like, if I was going to be like, okay, I'm uh, giving a job interview for someone who wants to be a fish breeder. Some questions I would ask that person if I was interviewing them to be a fish breeder. First one is, uh, how is your eye for detail? Good, good. Uh, do you have an interest in science? Right? I bet you none of you have seen that one coming. I bet you none of you have seen that one coming. Do you have an, I'm not asking you to be a scientist. I'm not asking if you're good at science. What I'm asking is if you have an interest in science and I hope the answer is yes because if the answer is no it's not for you uh, and why I say that is because we deal with every type of science that's available we deal with biology right we're, we're hatching eggs into living creatures that that grow that's biology uh, chemistry it's even in the name water chemistry um, we're dealing with everything physics everything so if you don't like science or don't have an interest in science this breeding is not for you um, what else would I ask what else do you enjoy aquarium keeping um, if the answer is yes then obviously that's a good answer if you want to do this you have to have a quest for learning you you need to want to learn constantly that's 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 bottom line you have to want to keep learning continual learning we will call it and you have to have yeah you have to enjoy science most of what I do down here is science not saying I'm smart not saying I'm good at science but I'm trying and uh, that's all that really matters that you're trying but water chemistry is a big one. I like to say I don't keep fish, I keep water. If I keep good water, I keep good fish. So, yes, water chemistry, science, those are like the main things I'd ask. And do you value your time? If you value your time, it's probably not for you. I spend at least four hours an evening in my fish room uh, working on the breeding projects 
that I have going. Um, Terry says, uh, I was always told never try to breed for profit because it's a losing proposition. Just breed for quality and the sales will come. That's a very good statement, Terry. It's a very good statement. Uh, yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. And the reason I like it is because if you're doing it for the love of it, if you're doing it for the love of it and you're doing well, um, then good good things are going to happen. But you have to make, along with that, you still have to make preparations, right? But I'm just going to try and get through some more of these uh, comments that... Uh, Well, you know what? We should tell the truth. We should most definitely tell the truth, and, and thank you for acknowledging that. I do find a lot of sugar coating on YouTube, and maybe that's why I don't have a lot of subscribers, because I don't sugarcoat anything. Um, we should tell the truth, and we should tell how it is. We should tell the difficulty or ease of difficulty. Some things people make out to make so much harder than they really are, when really... A lot of the stuff we do is not very hard at all. It's actually very, very simple. Um, so we should tell it either way. Rocco, you either have a thousand fish tanks or you got to find some efficiency. And welcome to the stream. That can be effective depending on how you're doing it. Very good, very good. I see a hello from Russia. Hello, Life. How are you? I only call you Life because that's all I can understand in your name. So I'm going to call you Life, unless you give me something else to call you here. But thank you and welcome. Welcome to the stream. Hello, Big J. Good to see you. Good to see you. Eventually, any money on some, you know, is the best job in the world. Okay. <laughs> no, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's just the way it is. So we talked about, we talked about doing a, like a mixed breeding for profit tank. And then there's the species only breeding for profit tank and that's where we get into some more advanced stuff and some more cool stuff that I like um, and when we start when I start going species only breeding for profit that's when I'm gonna break another regular fish keeping rule so what we would normally tell a beginner aquarist is don't chase numbers don't chase numbers don't chase your water chemistry use the water you have Use the water you have out of your tap, available, dechlorinated if that's needed, whatever, and get fish that are adaptable to your water. Come on. This is what we say, right? Right? So in this stream, I'm not going to do that. So I chase numbers. Um, I don't necessarily chase, and I should correct how I say that, but it, it is really what, what I do. In some of my tanks, I chase numbers. In my tanks, I don't have to chase numbers. I don't chase numbers. So when I say chasing numbers is I try to keep it very simple in my fish room because I do a few different types of fish. I guess I'll state what, what I am currently breeding, what I, what I currently keep, and hopefully breeding for some of them. But I do many, many different kinds of ancestors. They just get my tap water. My tap water is extremely hard, uh, like 8.2 pH, uh, 400 ppm, and uh, they do just fine in it. Um, then I have uh, I have a lot of shrimp. I don't have any neo caridina shrimp. I have all caridina shrimp, and I chase numbers for that. But I use specific methods to achieve those numbers. And what I'm going to tell you next is the difference between an advanced aquarist chasing numbers and a beginner aquarist chasing numbers is that I chase my numbers but my numbers are consistent consistency 
So if I was when, I'll rephrase that, when I was a beginner aquarist, and I'm not saying I'm a freaking guru or anything, but I know some things now. I know some things now that I didn't know then. Um, so when I was 12 years old and I was figuring out what I was doing, I didn't know anything about water chemistry at all. Water quality, water chemistry, any of it, right? So I got African cichlids, thankfully, because I had hard water, even though I didn't know it. I had hard water, and they love hard water, so things all all worked out great. And I did that. But say I wanted to keep, uh, hell, say I wanted to keep uh, a cardinal. So say I wanted to keep uh, uh, L128 uh, Hemi Ancestris, Blue Phantoms. Uh, they they would have died in that water. They they wouldn't have lived. They wouldn't have done well at all. Thankfully, they weren't available to me at that time. So yes, as a as a beginner aquarist, I say it: get fish that match your water, so you don't have to chase uh, water parameters. So what I do now is I do have some some things that need different water. So my Caradina shrimp, I use a product called Amazonia ADA. It's an active substrate soil, and I use RO water remineralized to a certain uh, PPM uh, using shrimp salts. And the ADA Amazonia buffers my water and keeps it at about 6.3 along with the shrimp salts. So I'm able to chase a parameter but keep a stable parameter in those tanks using that method. Another method I use for breeding fish, and I will show you a tank with that very shortly is I use straight up RO water and I use oak leaves and alder cones to buffer my water, add some serious tannins. Tank looks like shit. They, they look gross. Uh, they, they look brown, but that's just tannins. It's actually like you could drink that water, uh, but it's brown with tannins and it is one of the trade secrets for breeding fish. Um, having some tannins in your water, having your water not crystal clear. If you think about it, whenever you, where do you fry fish in lakes? I don't know if you, some of you are fisher people who go fishing. I do. I love fishing, and I, and I've studied fish basically all my life just by watching them and being around them. But where do you, let's say tadpoles too, tadpoles, fry fish, young fish. Where do they go to? They go to shallow, murky, kind of crappy water. They like to hide under, underneath the. Uh, aquatic vegetation they they don't necessarily go for the cleanest clearest water right so why not give them what they're going to be comfortable in so for instance I'll show you guys a, a video or I'll, I'll, I'll put my camera on uh, I have a, a tank of uh, baby fish or wood cats right now so I have their water very, very dark, but guess what? They don't like clear water. They don't like lots of light penetration in the water. They like it dark. They like stuff to hide in. They get scared in clear water. And uh, what happens to scared fish? They get stressed. And what happens to stressed fish? If there is a disease available, they will get it. Or they will grow slower. They might lose their appetite when they're stressed. All of these things, all of these things add up to a lack of success. Um, at least the chance of a lack of success, a risk that we don't need to take. And that's another part of fish breeding is limiting your risks. Um, so I try to limit my risks. So I give them tea-colored water when I have to. I give them tea-colored water. And uh, guess what? It, it, it's successful. Uh, not to mention the chemicals from the tannins. Uh, they help buffer the water. They help keep the water soft. Soft water works very well with soft water fish. Uh, fish or wood cats come from the Amazon. They come from very soft water. So I breed them in soft water. They can tolerate, and here's a difference between aquarium keeping and aquarium breeding. Fish or wood cats can tolerate straight up hard, hard water. They can tolerate my top water. They can tolerate a pH of 8.2, and they'll be perfectly happy. I doubt you'll have much breeding success. If they do breed, I don't know if the eggs will be fertile. Uh, because the hardness of the water will, will impact the fertility of the eggs. 
uh, it will impact the hatching of the eggs as well. With the softer water, the eggs will hatch better. They will they will uh, fertilize better. Everything will work better. So that's why I chase those numbers, but keep them very consistent. So I'm going to just take a moment to look over some of uh, the recent comments here. I'm sorry, uh, I'm very slow on it. Hello, Kyra. Welcome, welcome. Uh, uh, Terry says uh, you reach a point where you get bored with all the comfortable stuff, all the com with all the stuff comfortable in your water. It's all about the challenge after a while. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. I love being challenged. I love I love learning new stuff in the fish room. Hello, Fish Keeping Jamaica. Welcome, welcome. All right. We're all caught up. All right. So I'm going to just talk about a couple more quick items, and then we'll get a little more specific here. Um, just a few species, if you're watching and thinking, wow, I'd love to breed something. What I'll say is try to make sure that there's a market for it before you breed it. Uh, unless you plan on keeping them yourself. Uh, if they're not saleable, then, then there's no sense doing it uh, unless you're just keeping them to keep more fish for yourself. But some, I'm going to say easy to breed, tough to master. Some of these are, are tough to master, but uh, guppies. To add, just add water. Add a male and a female and add water and food, and they should breed. Now, that being said, Guppy breeding is one of the most in-depth species of fish to, to breed. And the reason I say that is that many, many people, many, and there's many, many organizations uh, that are so in-depth to breeding guppies and have such high standards of what those fish should look like for their specific type of guppy. Very, very high standards, lots of shows, lots of support, and uh, it gets real, real serious. Most serious, serious guppy breeders have close to 100 fish tanks, as they are usually trying to develop different lines and keep certain lines, uh, improve on them or keep them the way they are. So if you're getting into just breeding for profit, just dollar guppies, just add guppies to a tank, feed it, do water changes, and you'll be able to do that. Uh, it will take you years to master uh, professional guppy breeding, I'll call it, where you're actually developing lines and uh, uh, making a good reputation as a solid guppy breeder. That will take you many, many years. Actually, one of the hardest uh, things to achieve in fish keeping. Hello, Dan. Hey, JN. Just a quick one. Have you any experience using a Fluval FX6? As I now have 17 L46 and had a custom tank and stand built, but now looking for a filter. I do actually, uh, Dean. I have an FX6 on my 180 gallon uh, African Cichlid Ancestrous tank, and I love it. I love it. Um, they're expensive, very expensive. That's everybody's first complaint with them is they're expensive. But I have had this one going for over a year, and uh, it's not the only filter on my 180 gallon. They are rated for 400 gallons, uh, 400 gallon tank. Never in my life would I ever just put an FX6 on a 400 gallon tank and expect it to be healthy with uh, any decent uh, stock in it. Now, I don't know how big your tank is here, but um, yeah. Just make sure there's not too much flow. I know the L46 love flow, so I doubt it'll be a problem. But uh, fantastic filter. Not hard to clean. Uh, reprimes itself if it gets any air bubbles. Um, yeah, I love it. It's quiet. Lots of flow. Again, And like I said, the biggest complaint anybody has with an FX6, and most people that do complain about an FX6 are the people that aren't willing to buy one. Um, I'm happy I spent the 450 bucks or whatever I spent on it because other than cleaning it, I don't have to touch it.
You never see the jars on a shelf with green or brown water that probably stink is a thing only breeders know. <laughs> That's funny, Terry. I have very large water containers of green water um, in them, and that is my phytoplankton to feed my brown water of rotifers. Uh, but that is for I'm not even getting in the saltwater fish breeding today. Today I'm keeping it uh, as fresh water as possible. But uh, you may be talking about infrasia, I believe that's the pronunciation. Yeah, that's stinky gross crap too. Okay, I see Dean. 62 gallon tank. I don't think I'd put an FX6 on a 62 gallon tank. I don't think I would. It is too big. Too big. You're going to boil that tank. You're going to boil that tank. Maybe go down to like an FX4. I would, Dean, honestly. Uh, you can try it, but I, I think you're going overkill. I think you're going overkill. Um, so, yeah. So there's different types, right? All right. Let's uh, see. What else did I need to talk about before? Yeah, so the only thing I don't think I really touched on, and I only touched on things here, is uh, I didn't touch on the monetary investment. So there is a monetary investment when you're going to do this, right? You want to buy your broad stock. You want to buy your breeders. You want to buy your breeders, right? You don't want to buy a crappy fish for your breeders. You want to buy the best quality breeders you can afford for the species you're, you're purchasing. Uh, why start off? Why start off below the ball? Start off above, get ahead of things, and at least start off with uh, the best quality fish you can find uh, for what you're trying to breed. So there's some investment there. Uh, I know for a fact I have some fantastic quality uh, long fin uh, ancestors, and I sell them for $60 a pair. So if you're buying a pair off me you're, you're, and you want to breed them, um, you're starting with a $60 investment plus getting them from my place to your place. Bottom line, right? I had to do the same thing. So we all had to do the same thing. So you have an investment. You have to buy the equipment, the tanks. Um, maybe find an efficient way to not use all the utilities in your house. Uh, example, electricity. So if you're getting multiple, multiple tanks, you may want to go to a, a blower uh, air pump. Uh, that's what I've done. I have one air pump that runs my entire fish room and I can boil the water in every tank with it. It's so, so quiet. You can't hear it hardly at all. Um, it's in the room I'm speaking in right now and you, you guys can't hear it. Um, and not only that, it doesn't use very much, uh, it doesn't use very much electricity whatsoever. It's a Gemco pump, if anybody is, is wondering. So a little bit of efficiency on your utilities as well uh, will help you bag more money in your pocket and less money spending on, on raising your fish. Um, so, yes, between the tanks, heaters, um, your utilities, your time, everything else, there, there is an investment, and I hope uh, you're prepared for that. Uh, Dean says, I only say FXX sign. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm I'm totally with you on the L46, Dean. Uh, and I know they love a high flow. Here, here would be my suggestion. I would go with an FX4, and I would add a Wavemaker powerhead, if that's not enough. Put it down at the bottom of the tank, uh, blowing across the bottom, and uh, yeah. That, that's what I would do. I think an FX6 has uh, got too much balls for a 62-gallon tank. Uh, just My Fish says, I don't use big brands. I use APS 2000 canister filter. And uh, you believe it's better than the FX6 that you replaced it. Oh, very, very good. Very good. I've also recently 
started to go to other breeders and resell their fish to make a few extra pounds to fund my own fish keeping and breeding projects has worked well so far so there you go there's lots of different ways to uh, turn a profit most definitely so what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna turn the camera to just a broad stock tank this is a 90 gallon tank um, this is a 90 gallon ancestrous grow out tank so that's all that happens in here is I grow out ancestrous um, you can see the breeder baskets hanging there uh, and that's where they go when they're really really small and as they get bigger they get let go into the big tank as you see it's not pretty it's not pretty at all and it's uh, it's not meant to be pretty and that's the reason why I didn't clean it before I started the live stream anything I want you guys just to see it how it normally is there's usually a little bit of fish poo on the bottom uh, but there's also uh, a few hundred fish in that tank uh, but it's not meant to be pretty as you can see there is uh, one two three seven sponge filters going one barely going uh, but seven sponge filters powering that uh, that tank and uh, it stays healthy there's some duckweed up top a little bit of wood some hiding spots the sponge filters actually provide great hiding spots for them they love hiding around the sponge filters so the filter is acting as some security and and filtering the water and as you see they're just pounding for most of them uh, there is uh, some pothos up above the tank and you can see on the right hand side that the roots are flowed into the tank with some algae and crap on them. I can also say I never have to clean the inside of the glass of this tank uh, with all these ancestors in there. It's not required. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about breeding ancestors because they are actually one of the first fish I've noticed that most people like to jump into to start breeding for profit and like I said most local fish stores will accept them uh, and in my opinion we couldn't get enough of these little guys out into the aquarium society uh, just for the reason that I would like to see them abolish abolish importing common plecos never ends well for them that that's honestly one fish I can say in it, it never ends well for them they eventually get too big and there's only so many monster tanks out there compared to the amount of common placos that get sold little bristle notes are a little bit more money than common placos but generally grow to about five inches so they can be they, they can be kept in just about any aquarium whereas most people buy a common pleco they have a 20 gallon tank they buy it at three inches it's 10 inches in a year and a half and they either it either dies or or they have to find a new home for it so I I would love to see as many as these guys get out as possible so I don't actually breed them in this tank I don't actually breed them in this tank I don't clean the glass on this tank I don't what I do do is a lot of water changes on this tank uh, massive water changes so when I say massive water changes and this is where I'm going to get into talking about breaking the rules a bit uh, breaking the rules a bit between breeding fish and just keeping fish these guys eat a lot I'll try and get that camera in a little bit closer down on them eating there in a second and and they 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 eat a lot they just they eat a lot I feed them a lot I pound the food to them because because I want them to grow fast I want them to grow very fast and they create a lot of waste when you pound the food to them and that in turn plays on your water quality um, and again I'll take this just a little bit step further for the people that are a little more interested in water chemistry it when you have a high pH tank so this water is very hard very high pH ammonia is much more deadly 
So this tank has a pH of 8.2. Ammonia is absolutely deadly at just about any level of ammonia when you have a high pH. The lower the pH you have, the less deadly ammonia is. So again, that may be why sometimes it's just better to use soft water for breeding, period. But I know these things. And so knowing these things, I know I have to keep clean water in this tank. Thus, I usually use a little bit of prime with my water changes, about half the recommended dose, because I know I don't have ammonia. I just want to make sure. And I do 50% generally at least once a week, sometimes twice a week. If I was just keeping a bunch of plecos in a 90-gallon tank, I wouldn't have to do nearly that many water changes, nor would I feed this much food. Um, types of food that I feed ancestors uh, to raise them. They eat a lot of zucchini. I feed them a lot of fresh zucchini. Uh, I don't know if you can see it there, uh, but I, I keep forks in the tank and I, and I put the zucchini, raw zucchini right on a fork and I let them eat it raw and they love it. Gives them something to do. They're, they just constantly go at it until it's all gone. Um, they get a lot of uh, North Finn uh, kelp flake, a lot of North Finn kelp flake. Um, and yeah, I, I don't, that's pretty much what they get. It's pretty much what they, they get to eat. North Finn kelp flake, North Finn uh, veggie cichlid pellets as well, the veggie cichlid. Now, a lot of people will argue with me. And, uh, and it's, it's their right too, if it works for them, to add a little more high protein. I do not. I do not. Because I consider an ancestrous digestive system much like that of a, a Mabuna cichlid. It's very, very short. Very, very short because they are meant to eat primarily uh, vegetation. So... The higher proteins, krill, uh, krill, brine shrimp, blood worms, uh, beef heart, all this super high protein stuff. Uh, really, you're not doing them a justice. You're better off to feed them a lower protein vegetable diet for a longer, give them more, I should say. Give them more of it than you would a higher protein uh, diet, and they will fare out much better because they won't get bloat and they won't die. Um, bloat is a serious intestinal issue that will happen with too high of a protein and I find when yeah when you start adding a lot of high animal proteins and whatnot into a, a vegetarian fish essentially um, you run into problems you think you're you think you're getting ahead but I don't think you really are I'm not anyways I've tried it and I this is the method I, I choose see some questions here yeah they do yep uh, deshelled frozen peas uh, they love them for sure um, most definitely that's a good food for them now your L46 can take a lot more protein than ancestors can they have a different digestive system they're a hemi ancestors so hemi ancestrous uh, plecos, I have a L128 and L106. Uh, I feed them a lot of zucchini, a lot of zucchini, but I also feed them a lot of higher proteins too. But like I said, they, they do have a different digestive system than ancestrous do. No, I don't. No, I don't. And I know a lot of people do. I actually like them to have to work at it. I think it makes them stronger, to be honest with you. It doesn't foul as quickly either. I can actually leave a piece of zucchini in for a couple of days usually. Uh, but I use I use literally half of a medium-sized zucchini in that tank to feed them. And it doesn't go bad as well. And I just use the fork to hold it down. Uh, Dean says, I use half tap water and half RO water, also adding prime to the mix. Find its perfect parameters. I also use prime when doing a water change on salt water. Yes, I do for salt water for sure, Dean. 
Um, I don't know how hard your water is, uh, but your L L uh, forty six. I know they they will absolutely love a pH between six and six point five. Um, yeah. Yep. Exactly. Hmm. Can you please explain that to me, just, just my fish, so I know what uh, the reason that you would do that. Okay. So yeah, for raising them, this is why I say lots of water changes, lots of food. That's what we're talking about. That's where it's different from just raising fish, uh, sorry, just keeping fish to breeding fish is that lots of water changes, lots of food, lots of mess, lots of vacuuming the bottom, a lot more upkeep, a lot less emphasis on pretty. Uh, as you can see, it's not pretty. I keep a bare bottom so it's easy to clean. Whether I'm cleaning up uh, if I can find deceased fish easier, it's going to happen. When you have hundreds of fish, you're going to find deceased fish. Uh, it doesn't happen every day, but once in a while. Um, yeah, and to clean up all the, all the poop. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to move the camera actually to... A different type of breeding tank I don't want to go much over an hour here but we'll go over one other uh, hatching and raising tank that I've uh, I'm, I'm using as we speak so just give me a quick second here guys I don't know how well we can see it. Oh, there's an awful lot of glare. A lot of glare. Hmm. I'll have to get closer and maybe the glare will go away. No. Okay, so like I said, there's a lot of glare there up close, but uh, I'm just going to feed that tank and maybe we'll see them swimming around. Okay. Ah, yes, about the, uh, I put it in an airtight jar. I put it with salt water. Put it in the fridge, lasts for months. It's eaten around four seconds. Hmm. That's a very good preservation technique. What about the, uh, do you not change your water chemistry with all the salt in it? But anyways, this tank we're, we're looking at here. This is a this is a, a a ten gallon tank that is highly tannined. It's straight RO water, highly tannined. Lots of alder cones, lots of oak leaves, and I put a bunch of uh, Fisher Woodcat eggs in there, and uh, a whole bunch of them have hatched. Now they love this stuff. They love this. And what I did was. I'm just showing everybody how simple it can really be to 
hatch and raise some fish. So I have a 72 gallon bow front tank that has uh, a trio of Fisher Wood Cats in it. Uh, they breed regularly. In fact, the bottom of the tank is scattered with eggs as we speak right now again. I vacuum those eggs up into a bucket. I put that water and eggs into this tank. I added another 30% uh, fresh RO water of the same temperature which is about 80 degrees Fahrenheit. I added my breeders blend of, of <laughs> plants in there and that's basically Christmas moss mixed with uh, guppy grass, some water lettuce, some duckweed, just everything that makes a tank not necessarily look that good uh, but the fry love it. So it's got all kinds of biofilm on it that they eat. They have it for security to hide in. The water's highly tannin, very soft, and uh, I'm feeding them. I thought I could get it in the picture frame there, but uh, North Fin Fry Starter, which is 100% ground up krill. This is as simple it can be. Literally add eggs and water, add a bit more fresh water, add a few alder cones and oak leaves, and a bunch of crappy aquatic vegetation and leave it be until they hatch and then just sprinkle uh, fry starter krill high protein they can take high protein and they'll eat anything they see in the water even if they didn't like my food right off the bat there was enough nutrition on all that uh, plant matter in there that would get them by until they did learn to like something I was giving them that's how easy it can be. Seasoned sponge filter and a heater. That's all that's in there. Well, Dean, I was going to do that, but I'm not really doing that this stream. What I'll tell you is I've had some successes and I've had some failures. I've sold some. Um, I do have some larvae on the go right now, but I'm trying something different, and uh, my camera actually can't even reach to them right now, but I do have some larvae on the go, and I do have lots of young clownfish still, and uh, I did lose the last batch of larvae. Uh, they died, so that's why I'm trying, going back to basics with it. So I'll let you know how they're doing in a week or so. So that's how simple it can be. I'm guessing there's about 100 fry in there. And as they get bigger and they outgrow that tank, I will find them a spot where they can grow even bigger. Fun fact, if anybody didn't, uh, if people don't know much about fish or wood cats, I am, I am going to guess that fish or wood cats are one of the fastest growing fish there is. Fact. Fact. So just to let everybody know, I've already raised some bigger than this. I raised three fisher woodcats, ones I just found in the in the tank that had hatched and they were up in the duckweed and I put them in a little breeder basket. In a little breeder basket in the 72 gallon tank, I raised them from like tadpole fry to an inch and five eighths in length in a month and a week. Right? That's crazy. Crazy. If someone would like to put a fish on here that grows faster than that, that could be kept in an aquarium, please do so because I think you're going to be hard pressed to find. Saleable in a month and a half. I've never had any other kind of fish that was saleable in a month and a half at a good size. So. I'm really enjoying breeding these guys and I enjoy the quick turnaround on them as well. They are very rare in Canada. I don't know who else has them. Somebody else does have them in Canada because obviously I got mine. I got mine from, as was stated earlier, I got my parents from uh, an aquarium auction in London, Ontario. Right, Terry? It is insane. I can't believe it. I haven't done anything special for them. I feed them a lot of krill, feed them a lot of 
pulverized uh, uh, larger cichlid pellets. They don't seem to mind what they eat. They just get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, what I can say for my parents, I bought them at about two inches in length a year and a half ago, and I believe they are full grown. My male is smaller than my two females, which uh, all accounts I've read, it's supposed to be that way. And uh, he's about oh, seven or eight inches, and the females are eight to nine inches. They're actually very, very gentle in their big tank. Uh, the only other occupants in the tank, which surprisingly do not eat the eggs either, the parents don't eat the eggs, and my other occupants uh, don't eat the eggs, and I have my L128s and my L106s in that tank as well, and that's all that's in that tank. But yeah, some rainbows take forever to grow. I probably have some of the largest New Guinea red rainbows any of you have ever seen, but like they're like three years old now. They they uh, they they took quite a while. Quite a while to raise as well. Uh, Dean says that's a shame. The last batch of clownfish you had showed looked like there was hundreds in the tank. Yeah, that was. I was uh, quite pissed off about it. We'll say, Dean. Um, it was unexpected, but yep, they they didn't make it. I believe they were weak going into metamorphosis because I did have a bit of a rotifer shortage at the uh, at the very start of their life. And uh, I think that's what happened. I think they were weak going into metamorphosis, and they just uh, pined off. So I have some more, and they have tons of rotifers. Uh, so they should do very, very well. So to get back to this, I can't put enough emphasis on the simplicity you can do when breeding fish. Like I said, literally a 10 gallon tank, some uh, tannin water, seasoned sponge filter, and a heater and water out of the parent's tank with a water change in it. Now that being said, I do do about a 20% water change daily on this tank. And as I notice the water getting lighter, if I'm losing tannins, I add more alder cones. Um, I would like to speak a little bit on the benefits of alder cones. Um, I collect my own for one. They're free. They're free for me. I do sell them. People buy them off me. But I collect my own alder cones, and I, I literally collect them by the, like, absolute bag full. I'll show you, actually. Give me one second. This is one bag full of alder cones I have, and I have another one as well. I collected these last winter, actually, and these are like big alder cones, big. This was a great batch to get. Put that up to the camera there. So as you can see, like they're big, big alder cones. So. Some of the benefits of alder cones is they, they have some antibacterial properties. So what I mean by that is they actually have chemicals inside them which come out with the tannins that will help your eggs from becoming fungus. Pretty cool, eh? That gets rid of uh, methyl blue. Uh, so you don't need methyl blue with them. Not to say your eggs, if you cluster them up too much and don't get enough aeration to them or anything like that, will become fungus. You can't, the alder cones won't stop it from happening, but it will definitely help prevent it from happening. Uh, if, uh, if your parent breeder fish 
uh, incur any injuries during breeding. I can tell you Fisher Woodcats, it's some of the most violent breeding I've ever seen in my life. The male actually wraps himself around the female and inserts himself into her. Um, it ain't much she can do about it. It is fast. It is violent. It is it is crazy. Uh, injuries happen. And other fish the same. The males will harass the females to, to no end. Even with guppies, they will harass them. The males will harass the females to no end. They'll get thin nips. They might get scrapes, bumps, anything else. Which, if there is bacteria in your tank, bad bacteria, you can get a bacterial infection. And alder cones help with uh, preventing bacterial infections. Uh, Terry says, if you're going to talk breeding for profit, then you should talk about the amount of tanks, running air, running electric, and the sheer amount of tanks, etc., etc. That's a very that's a very diverse thing to talk about, uh, Terry, and, and that is, what I mean by that, it depends how far you want to go. How far do you want to go? Do you want to keep uh, just one tank as a breeding for profit tank, where you have it set up with some substrate, plants, Plecos, some ancestress, some uh, maybe some cherry shrimp, maybe some guppies, and just work out of the one tank. Or do you want to develop lines? Do I guess where where we run into getting into multiple, multiple, multiple tanks, like I have, is when you want to be consistent with being able to produce. So let's say. Let's, we'll talk about clownfish. We'll do it. Fine. I'll talk about clownfish. So, I want to breed clownfish. And I want to breed clownfish on a large enough scale that I can supply at a wholesale level. So, that sounds easy, right? No. No. It's not easy. They need to be staged. So, I need to be consistent with my breeding. Be consistent with my fry rearing lar at this for clownfish, larvae rearing into fry rearing, and this can be said for just about any type of fish other than the larvae part of it. But you need to be have consistent sizes available all the time. So if you are wanting to supply wholesale, let's say clownfish at an inch to an inch and a quarter. If you're going to supply clownfish at an inch to an inch and a quarter, consistently and be able to supply them at least on a monthly basis, then you're going to find out how long it takes you to raise clownfish to an inch to an inch and a quarter. I figured that out. It takes me six months to get them to an inch to an inch and a quarter. And that's a real inch. That's not a, eh, that looks like an inch. No, that's taking a tape measure and measuring them and seeing that they're an inch to an inch and a quarter. I don't like to guess. I don't like to guess on sizes. I'm a carpenter. I can... I can look at something and tell you how long it is in inches and fractions of inches. That's what I do all day, every day. But I still take a tape measure. Being a carpenter, I still take a tape measure and actually measure my fish so I can see what size I'm promoting to sell or what size I'm trying to achieve to sell and what my customers want for a size to be sold to them. So to get clownfish to an inch to an inch and a quarter, it's going to take – at least six months with great water quality and a heavy feeding schedule. Okay, so now we need to have enough tanks to support raising fry from nothing to six months, but be able to have them at an inch to an inch and a quarter every month consistently after you've obviously gone through your first six months to get your first batch that big. That requires a massive amount of tanks. That requires, luckily with clownfish, if you're on a sump system and you're, and you're providing fantastic water quality, your actual space they require per fish is very, very little, as long as they need, as long as they have great, great water. So you could keep 200 clownfish babies in a 20-gallon tank with great water quality. So if you want to sell 200 a month, even 100 a month, however you want to do it, you need to have at least six tanks plus your larvae tanks on top of that to achieve that, to have it go out monthly. 
So right there, just for one pair of clownfish, if you want to breed consistently from them for one pair, you're going to need, with the larvae tanks and the parrot tanks, you're going to need at least, I'm going to say, 10 tanks. So if that answers your question at all, on a very specific basis, but it's the same thing for ancestors. It's the same thing for guppies if you're running lines. It's the same thing for barbs, catfish, tetras, frontosas. Same thing for frontosas. You're not going to put quarter inch fry in with uh, inch and a half fry for frontosas and most people want frontosas uh, at two, two and a half inches uh, to buy them anyways, right? So you're going to have to have stage tanks along with uh, the different sizes. That's going to go for every kind of African cichlid you have. Um, so it matters what you're breeding and how consistent if you're trying to do it to generate a monthly income or if you're just doing it once in a while for fun. Let's not forget that word, fun. If you're not having fun doing it and looking after 10 tanks is taking all the fun out of it for you, you either need to scale back, find something else to breed, breed on a smaller scale, or find a more efficient way to do what you're already doing. Those would be the ways I would look at that. So I'm going to catch up on the, uh, on the uh, chat here for a sec. Uh, Dean asked if anybody else in the UK is breeding for profit. Well, you're a methyl blue lover. I'm going to use some today, and today is going to be the first time I've used methyl blue in probably a year. I have a whole pile of catfish eggs. I'm going to siphon them out of the bottom. I'm just going to siphon them into a five-gallon tank with the parent water, add a water change, a heater, and... A sponge filter. I mean rocking. I mean I'm gonna try and boil it and uh, I'm gonna see if I can hatch a couple hundred catfish eggs just out in a five gallon bucket for the next few days but I'm gonna use methyl blue just in case they fungus up because I'll be putting so many in there. Uh, just my fish says he sold on eBay before but it takes too long to sell and shipping is just too expensive. Uh, Dean says, and I believe Dean's coming from the UK, a lot of local fish store will only give you store credit, and that's where they make their money. I find a lot of people sell on eBay and aquarium forums also. Shepuck and similar sites for better profits and money instead. So, and that's where I come back to what I said earlier in the stream, Dean, about uh, developing a relationship with those local fish stores. I can tell you every local fish store I sell to, I get cash, uh, cash or check. Uh, I, I don't, uh, I don't do store credit, but I've developed over years uh, relationships with them and consistency on being able to provide when they need it, uh, the fish they need that they know I breed, and um, that's where we're more on a business level rather than an uh, a hobbyist coming in just to trade some fish in for more equipment. But you have to develop that relationship. Okay. Uh, Dean says, I resell on eBay but change to collection only or ask the seller to sort out their own shipping if they wish them to be sent via courier. I myself really stray away from shipping. I generally sell wholesale or expect people to come in and uh, pick them up for porch pickup or whatever because uh, yeah um, yeah I just I don't like shipping fish and I live in Canada and our weather is so all over the place that uh, shipping's I just don't like doing it. Terry says it takes me six to eight tanks to breed, breed one strain of guppies. That is very, very correct. Once you've uh, sorted out your calls from your keepers, from your males and your females, and keep your females not from not being impregnated until they get larger, um, yeah, and sort out what strains you want, most definitely. And that is very responsible guppy keeping, Terry.
Uh, just fish says, I could probably do that, but I don't want fish keeping and dreading to become a job as I think it would take the fun out of it once it all becomes mandatory. That is a part of it. That is definitely a part of it that everyone should think about before they get into breeding for profit. Uh, Dean says, hey, Jan, could you not use buckets for the clownfish babies to save on tank space then? Uh, when big enough, divide it into tank size tanks into size tanks. I guess you could, Dean. I could. It's um, For me, it's not... At the point, I have tons of space right now for clownfish. Tons of space. For me, it's not the point of space right now. You still have to take care of that space. And if you're doing five-gallon buckets, the care is going to be extraordinary. Extraordinary. The water changes are going to be extraordinary. And I think it would be really, unless I use, like, clear buckets or something, it would be very, very difficult to see what's going on inside them. Um, I've taken this to the point of with my rotifer cultures and my phytoplankton cultures, I use clear, I use a 10 gallon aquarium for one of my rotifer cultures now, just because I want to be able to see exactly what's going on from all sides because uh, I can catch something. If something's not right or something's going bad or, or whatever, I, I find I catch it a lot easier. Very good, very good. Well, that's good to corner a market, too. So that's basically what I want to talk about today. I want to get into, in a future live stream, maybe now that we've had an introduction to uh, to what uh, this series essentially is going to consist of, we're going to get into more detailed, uh, specific fish breeding. And I would actually like to actually bring on more people than just myself. I'm going to bring a guest on next time, hopefully. I'm going to try to, I should say. Is And uh, we get different perspective on what works for fish breeding and what doesn't work for certain species of fish breeding. So I hope everybody's gotten something out of this live stream. That's purely what this was for, was uh, hoping uh, just to get some... Uh, just, just to get some information out there and get some talking about actual fish breeding. And, and like was said earlier, just getting people freaking honest with it. Uh, about what it takes, the costs, your efforts, uh, even the dirty side of fish breeding that is unavoidable if you're going to produce uh, quality fish. So for everybody who actually stuck with this live stream to the end, thank you. Appreciate it. Hopefully I didn't uh, bore everybody too badly with my rambling on. And, uh, yeah, next time I will pick a certain type of fish to uh, talk about, and we're only going to talk about that, how to breed that type of fish. So from us to you, happy fish keeping. And until next time, everybody, take care. And to my moderators, thank you very, very much for all you do here and your help and uh, everybody's participation in the chat. Take care, guys. Ciao.